Right, it's now time to move on to you, and I'm going to do my best at trying to see you all, because the lights are quite bright, so apologies if I don't see you. You may have to wave your arms around a bit crazily. Uh, we will off, we're going to open it up for, for general discussion. You can have questions to some of our speakers or to the room. Uh, you might want to take a particular point that they've made, agree with it, disagree with it, change it slightly, or add new forms of uh, questions for scientists or journalists or other people who might be in the room. Uh, you might want to add new recommendations for these groups too. Um, you might just want to add experiences or thoughts. Uh, if you could wait for a microphone before you speak. Does anyone have anything they want to say? And if you could say who you are and uh, just introduce yourself, roughly where you come from, that would be useful just to, I think, to foster a friendly feeling of discussion in the room. Yeah. Um, Bob Ward from the Grantham Research Institute. I didn't want to be the first speaker, but nobody else was putting their hand up. Um, I wanted to raise a question, um, a term that hasn't been mentioned tonight, but I'm surprised it isn't, is the public interest, which ultimately is supposed to be the overriding guide to um, any sort of journalism. And I wondered if people's reflections on how that influences this debate. But I would also make an appeal that um, there is an opportunity now with the Leveson Inquiry to influence the future, particularly of the way in which the press reports um, science stories, and that more people should um, be submitting evidence. Fiona Fox is the only person who has given oral evidence so far specifically about the reporting of science and health. The number of written submissions on science and health issues is very low. And my personal opinion is that the Press Complaints Commission has utterly failed to uphold the... Um, standards that one would expect. In fact, they haven't held up the standards that show why science journalists do such a good job. But this comes to my main point here, is that the reason why science is different is because it has a set of standards within it which most science journalists are aware of, and in their process of checking, they are checking that happening. In my view, the system that The Guardian has introduced with James Randerson now on the news desk where he gets a chance to see the news stories should be standard and it should be standard not just for news stories but in particular for appalling opinion pieces where the regulatory process has utterly failed because you can write anything you want in an opinion piece at the moment no matter how wrong and inaccurate, and it's, they're able to publish it on the grounds that it's a, a matter of opinion. The laws of physics are not a matter of opinion. In the same way that uh, copy gets routinely legaled, I think it's time that it's um, routinely scienced when well, it's writing about that, science. That's a really interesting point to... to I don't know if any of you saw the Poles Apart report that was done by the, uh, the Reuters Institute Studies uh, Media in Oxford. They did some research on climate change in the media and they found that it was the climate scepticism in the UK media was much more prevalent in the opinion pieces rather than the science pieces. So you might say that the Telegraph is terrible on environment, but actually if you look at stuff from their environment and science correspondence, it's not so bad, it's the, it's the comment pieces. But there was lots of, in Bob's point. Uh, have any of you... Um, given written evidence to Leveson? Uh, you have, haven't you? Yes. Yeah? And Science Media Centre, maybe the people here from uh, Cancer Research UK or Welcome might have been involved in it. And also the point about the public interest. I think it was interesting that it hasn't been mentioned yet. So maybe um, just to respond to Bob as a whole, maybe the people who said something, do you want to say why you didn't say anything about public interest? Did you forget about it? Or... Um. Well, in, in my case, I mean, we felt that all of our points are in the public interest. It's almost, we should have made, perhaps made it clear, but really all of, all of the steps we propose would lead to more accurate press releases or additional information for journalists. But obviously we don't want to go down the deficit modelling route here, but more information for journalists is probably good. And also, of course, um, watching the neighbourhood, you know, keeping an eye out for, for claims that are made by scientists or politicians without evidence, which are, you know purportedly based on science, is also in the public interest. So I would say all of our points address that in to some extent. Um, I don't know if Petrock or Jackie want to add anything to that, but... I'll just add that... I think we Do have the start. microphone? We have a roving mic. So we've had discussions over beer about whether, when the public interest actually goes against our own interest as scientists, which does sometimes happen. So, for example, you know, it, we would like to get a piece of our research in the press. But actually, if you step back and say, 
but is it actually in the public interest for this to get into the press at this stage of the research when we're not yeah. completely clear what the results are and so on? No, mate, you know, you, and sometimes were, we have to put public interest over our own egos. Well, you said that you were, you were speaking, you hoped that it was behind you and what you were saying yeah. was in the public interest, but then it's a very yeah. flexibly applied term, what is in the flex... You know, how do we define... Yeah. Uh, did you want to say anything about that term? Yeah, actually, um, I, think, I think Chris is right. I think the subtext of our recommendations is basically, you know, how do we serve the public interest better? I mean, if, if you do journalism better, the assumption is that you are serving the public interest better. So the recommendations that I had tune into that too. I do want to say, though, that we shouldn't be naive about this and that there is another interest at stake, and that's the interest of the newspaper. Um, you know, that, so, so to, to an extent, that's why I didn't mention it overtly, Bob, um, that we're having a very laudable discussion here, but remember the online editor. Well, then, maybe the online editor is <coughs> responding to the public interest because that's how they sell papers. Or maybe they that, might... There's different, <laughs> there are lots of different funding models. I'm sure that we've that's already... People statement. have mentioned the BBC <laughs> and the Guardian and the Daily Mail and Nature. These are all very different ways of funding and having links to concepts of public interest through funding. Um, did either Fiona or Ed wanted to say why you hadn't mentioned the word public interest? Do you well, care? I mean, the, the reason we gave evidence to Leveson was because the... For weeks and weeks, we just heard him talking about how phone hacking is damaging the public interest, and and the whole thing was about this, you know, unearthing celebrities' love lives. Um, but but actually, I'm not much bothered about that, and it just it really struck us in the office that if you're looking at when it goes wrong, what does the most damage? And this is maybe where I would argue that science reporting, maybe it's not a special case, but when it goes wrong on climate change or on MMR or on you know stop taking aspirin or whatever, it really does damage the public interest in a very tangible. way. Way. So one of the reasons we gave evidence was to say public interest, don't just say it applies to celebrities and whatever. And that maybe is the implication there that the scientists know what's the public interest? Mm. Going back, this might be something that people will have a view on. Did um, tap at the behind? Yeah. Thank you. I, I'd just like to make three points. Uh, my name is uh, John Illman. Uh, I'm a former medical correspondent on the Daily Mail, the paper everyone loves to hate. Mm -hmm. But the paper that most... I, I would guess most people in this room haven't actually read it. Um, I also spent um, eight years on The Guardian as health editor and three years on The Observer as medical correspondent. So that's, that's where I come from. Um, first point uh, is for Chris. Chris, there is a kite-marking system operating in the, in the US and I believe in New Zealand, but it's just restricted to health stories. The second point, and I can send you the link if you're interested in that, it's run by a, a lovely guy who used to be a, um, a, tele, um, a medical correspondent for CNN. Super guy, and he'd be delighted to talk to you, I know. The second point I'd like to make is that the most difficult thing to do as a journalist is to tell the truth. That might seem an extraordinary thing to say, but it's amazing how often um, your sources actually get in the way, and sometimes they want you to tell a totally different story for reasons that are not altogether laudable. The third point I wanted to make, and <clears throat> I hate to take issue with Fiona Fox, because she's a lovely person. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to say, Fiona, that you know, this, this whole issue about the journalist versus the reporter and the reporter being some kind of stenographer, if some Nobel Prize winner says something outrageous, then I am going to report it, and I have a duty to report it. And who the hell am I um, to do otherwise when I'm reporting, say, immunology on Monday, genetics on Tuesday, a row in the health service on Wednesday geriatrics on Thursday and cardiology on Friday. You know, we are like little butterflies flitting from one thing to the other. And I don't think we should get on our high horses too much and pretend that we are the definitive scientific authority on anything, because we're not. We, we can, however, question other people about that. But that was the only point you made that really, really worried me. Thank you. Do we have any? If you understand, she's on your side. Do we have anybody who wanted to respond to that or something else? Um, somebody at the, up there. Um. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm Simon Bohr. I'm a media relations uh, director uh, for uh, BAA, the airport operator, so I deal with journalists. Um, I wanted to just um, talk about this um, public interest aspect and sort of slightly phrase the question in a different way, really, which is to ask what society needs from both scientists and journalists. And it seems to me that we want and need scientists to continue to expand human knowledge and make um, incredible scientific breakthroughs. But a lot of those scientific advances raise uh, huge ethical questions, which I think most scientists would accept. It's for society to determine how that knowledge is used. Uh, and that means that we need journalists as a medium between scientists and the broader public to be able to explain some very complex and difficult concepts in a way that helps the public to um, make the uh, informed decisions about how they want that scientific knowledge to be used. And that to me means that I think we need scientists to see part of their role as actually explaining things to journalists and we need journalists to report science in an open and fair way. So I'd suggest that on things like GM foods or the MMR vaccine, actually that's not, it's not acceptable that journalists are doing that because actually their news editor wants a good story. I think that's a fundamental failure of journalism's role in society. Okay, well, what, I mean, well, what do other people think about this idea that society, what society, can we think of society as a whole? I mean, there are other groups other than the MMR. There might be people who say that it's the journalist's job to critique the way in which science is structured and funded and that there are to help us unearth questions that science wouldn't otherwise ask itself. Uh, there are all sorts of, I mean, do we have anybody, I think, uh, Connie at the front? likely to have an opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> Always likely. Uh, Connie St. Louis. Um, I want to just come back to the MMR debate, which has always been heralded as a failure of journalism. And I think it would be very useful for us to just rewind and think about it as a failure of science, because the scientists published those papers, peer review reviewed them, and they went out. Now, there should have been some questions the science journalists should have asked. But I think at the MMR debate being held up as a failure of science journalism is one of the, the wrong, wrongest mistruths I've heard being told. This is a failure of science. And actually, this is, I think this keeps repeat, the pattern that keeps repeating, that the scientists get away without anything being, without, without being called to account because actually they were the ones who put the work out there. And good science should have picked up that it was rubbish. And they didn't. And it did take a journalist eventually, poor old Brian Deer, who went against heaven and earth, to uncover it. But remember how many reports there were done by scientists and doctors before MMR was exposed. And I think as we think about this debate, we, we have to think about what science is doing because science hasn't been interrogated. I say that many, many times, and that's what science journalism should be doing. There's another point I was surprised maybe we hadn't heard earlier is the role of journalism to interrogate science. Um, there's a lady up here who's had a hand up for a while. Hi there, I'm Nicola Davis. I've got a PhD in chemistry and I work for Times Eureka magazine. Um, so I just want to pick up on that point actually about the peer review and how things get through the net and journalists are dealing with what's put out by scientists. And actually I want to take the point that um, a couple of people have made about how scientists should blog more and journalists should be using these blogs as another source. But actually, as a, from my journalist hat on, my concern with that is that you have no idea about the credibility of what's in that blog. And you have the problem as well of who shouts the loudest also gets more blog coverage. So you might have a story that has really very little scientific credibility, getting a huge amount of blog posts being written and written and written about it. Um, so I think blogging is, is great in one way, and it's great for scientists to, um, as a way for scientists to bring to journalists' attention certain items, but I think it's really a dangerous territory as well, because there's no kite mark on a blog. Do, uh, do people agree with that? Disagree? Do we have any other? Um, do we have a, a question up at the back up here? Can we get someone from? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Terry O'Connor. Um, I currently work for one of the research councils. Previously, a chief political correspondent and a press secretary. So I've been both sides of the fence. Um, 
There was a question asked earlier in one of the points about science and the responsibility to publicise it. If you are publicly funded, you have a responsibility to public to publish your research, and there is a responsibility for the public to know what you're doing. That's why it's taxpayer funded. Um, but I'm a bit surprised. Uh, the debate is obviously because it's uh, sponsored by the Guardian, and thank you very much for doing it. But uh, I think it's missing a, a whole aspect here. Um, Fiona mentioned the Press Association in passing. An awful lot of coverage is actually done directly off a press release now by web crawlers and by harassed people. I used to work for a wire service. And it goes straight out into the medium and it is published online immediately on reputable sites as breaking news on newspaper sites. And that material, the quality of that, I work very hard with my press office team to ensure that we have accurate material, and yes, we go back to the researchers and fact check everything we say, which with you dealing with 26 universities consortium can be quite time consuming. But the bottom line is we want as compelling a story as we possibly can that is factually accurate because we know it isn't just going to the science correspondents here, it's going direct to the public on websites around the world. And I'm a bit surprised by the comment at the beginning by Alec that, that no, you don't fact check with uh, particular science stories. I'm not quite sure why you wouldn't. Do you want to respond to that? Because I would have thought that a lot of that was in agreement. Was that, was that to, to I don't know Chris? Who, or to do you mean me? And to Chris? No, to Fiona? Oh, no, no. Hi. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I didn't say you should fact check. I think that's really important. What I said was... Um, <laughs> I sometimes regret writing that Guardian blog post, I really do. Um, but um, I, said, I said reporters should not copy check their entire story with the source of the story, as in with the scientist. So if you are passing your story to the guy whose research you're writing about, I would say that you, and you're doing that on a regular basis, I would say you are doing a bad job. Um, so that's all I said. Fact-checking is absolutely vital. So, you know, even reading bits out over the phone, I think, is acceptable. But what I don't think is acceptable, and certainly not acceptable routinely, is passing the whole story back, especially including, you know, reaction quotes and all of that, and then messing around for the next two hours trying to tinker with it to get it just so your scientist source loves it. Hi, um, I'm James Randerson, Environment and Science News Editor at The Guardian, and uh, I think um, early on Bob was, uh, was kind of promoting me to editor and wanting me to read every single word that is printed <laughs> in The Guardian, so I might be a little bit busy. Um, I just wanted to make um, a couple of points. One is about the question of, um, is science special in a newspaper? And um, I, th I know that everyone in this room uh, believes that science is special for various reasons, and, and so do I. But in terms of a newspaper context, no, it's not. I think it would be very difficult to convince my colleagues on the business desk that um, a science story that may well have lots of jargon and lots of difficult concepts in it is any harder to understand and report than something really crunchy about the, uh, you know, the, the state of the economy and why the global economy is in meltdown. You know, I suspect there are, there are debate, academic debates going on there about how... Uh, you know, the, the phrase, the credit crunch, is, um, it, it glosses over huge amounts of, uh, a, a sort of complication about LIBOR rates and liquidity in the banks and so on, and is absolutely terrible and journalists shouldn't use it, but, but nonetheless we still use it because it's a useful um, shorthand. And so, um, yeah, I don't think scientists should expect uh, a different set of standards for, for science journalism. Having said that, I wanted to get on to the, the debate about, or this question of kind of stenography versus journalism. And I think we've kind of got, I don't know, I think it's a little bit of a, of a side alley in a way, because um, any good science journalist shouldn't just be, I mean, the, the, the point about, you know, if, a, if a, a Nobel Prize winner says something idiotic, then obviously we report it. We don't go, well, they're being an idiot, they don't mean that, so we can't, you know, we can't possibly report that because it's wrong. I mean, obviously you report it. But um, there's a huge amount of checking and, uh, um, uh, and, and sort of verification that, that's going on all the time in journalism um, about, you know, which stories you decide to report and which you don't. And, you know, so, so the, the claim that's based on some work in a, in a, in a, in a cell 
cell culture, uh, obviously you should have far less weight and, and in my view most of the time shouldn't be reported at all than something that's been, you know, a huge kind of meta-analysis on 10,000 people, you know, so th there is a huge amount of checking that goes on, certainly at The Guardian, and we, and we make those kind of judgments all the time, so, I, I, you know, just because journalists are, are reporting accurately what someone says, it doesn't make them a stenographer. Yeah, I think the point about... Um journalists working, particularly those who've got a bit more power at the editorial level, to stop stories coming out is one that maybe needs to be... I think came out in Andy Williams's report, if I remember rightly. It might have been something he just said when he was responding to it. The chap in the grey jumpers had his hand up for a while. Hi, I'm, um, I'm Peter Robell, I, and I, I'm a sort of semi-retired, semi-freelance at the moment, but I, I used to be... Uh, in the past, I was uh, chief sub-editor at New Scientist. I think I was the first sub-editor at New Scientist. Another story. Um, and uh, I was managing editor at Nature. And I, I think there are three things I'd like to say. The first is um, all this talk about um, copy editors should and sub editors should defer to various people. Um, I think things work quite well when also various people uh, defer to sub editors. The trouble is that there are, there are no, as far as I know, no, no, no people in, in the newspapers employed specifically to sub edit science. So uh, there are now, are there, but I'm not talking about the online, I'm talking about, <laughs> there are now, yeah. good. Um, um, but uh, there certainly need to be more. I'm not saying they all have to be scientists, um, but people who, have, who, who routinely do it. I think that, uh, yes, more, more, more stories in depth, I, I don't think anyone has really caught up properly with the reality of press releases. Press releases were never printed in newspapers because there was never any room. Well, there is room now, and it, it's called the web. If all you're going to do is rewrite or sub down a press release, there's no point. Shove it up and make a few comments as a note to it. And, and that way, actually, you can direct readers to a lot more interesting stuff than than they can find simply by going through what you have room for in, in your individual stories. Save, save, save the bylines and, uh, and for stuff that really has uh, original reporting to it. And the, the third thing, and I, I, something I've, I feel quite deeply, is that um, scientists sometimes have agendas. Uh, they very often have funding agendas. Um, and funding rounds, especially for something like fusion, do tend to go along with stories about new hope for fusion uh, regularly uh, every four years or, or something. Um, why do you think there's all this news about the, the possible Leonardo uh, in Florence? It's because they're actually looking for more funding. Their funding's run out, so but, but a huge thing. So we need, we need to look at that. I mean, I think, and as maybe people, uh, I'm sure some people will disagree, that the quality of science journalism is pretty good. Whenever I have seen in, in a newspaper something about a non-science story about which I know something, it has never been 100% accurate. Never been 100%. This is local newspapers, national newspapers, anything. Most science that I've read has been 100% accurate. Um, and uh, just to put in a word for the tabloids, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think much of the sun, but I do think um, it tends to cover science when it covers it pretty well, actually. Uh, and you could, uh, I, I can assure you, because I've done this test, you can give opening, you know, three or four paragraphs of news stories covering the same issue from different newspapers all the way around, and you ask people to identify the sun story, most people who don't read The Sun will not identify the science story. Do we have anyone here from The Sun? No, maybe not. <laughs> okay, so a, a celebration for The Sun, a celebration for sub-editors, and uh, pointing out that scientists have interest too. We have a uh, hand up, up there, a lady in the red uh, dress. <laughs> Hello, I'm Shauna Tregaskis. I'm sub-editor on Environment at The Guardian. And I just wanted to say to Fiona, hello. <laughs> I work normal hours. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I don't start work at 10 p.m. And I'm here, and I, 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 th I think that your organisation is massively neglected, probably. I think there should be more 
science specialist subs, of course. I think The Guardian is probably one of the only papers. It is the only paper. There should be more, and we should have better, if, better contact with you. If we're here to interrogate the reporters, then we're maybe the stepping stone between the scientists and the reporters. Another cheer for the sub-editors. <laughs> um, somebody just along. Hello, uh, my name is Catherine Delange. I'm a freelancer. Um, I just wanted to um, answer Ed's question. He said at the end there, um, who is the Daily Mail reporter and um, how do we reach them? And um, I met the Daily Mail reporter at a party and um, <laughs> she told me um, how sometimes she writes about science and I found it quite shocking because probably because I'm used to working mainly for new scientists and they do a really good job of reporting I think um, and she said this is what happens um, it starts when she goes to work in the morning because it's hot desking so she doesn't know where she's going to sit so if she happens to be sitting near a science editor she might get asked to write a science story so she tries not to do that but sometimes she gets to work and she has to sit somewhere um, and then the science editor might say, OK, um, you need to write this story about black holes. And she goes, oh, my God, what's a black hole? Um, and she goes on, like, Wikipedia and looks it up and then reads the press release and basically doesn't know whether it's right or wrong and actually just uses the press release. And I asked her, do you not, you know, if you don't understand it, do you not just talk to somebody, like maybe a scientist? And she said, no, because she has to do, I think, seven or nine stories in a day, and she just has to just get on with the next one. And I'm not saying that everybody's like that, but I think it's a problem with online reporting, where you just have to get so many stories up on the website, and I just thought I'd share that with Ed, because he was wondering who she is. Has anyone else met any interesting people at parties? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Or did, um, at this point, I wondered, actually, if, if, did either of you two want to respond or, or bring out of any of the other things that have come up? Is there any kind of summary points, this sort of halfway stage in the debate? Um, you... Go for um, it, Chris. I, I, like the, I take the point very well that, that reporters are very busy. I mean, this is obvious. And this is very true in, um, when, you, when you look at Andy Williams's report. Um, 25, I think, percent. I don't know if Andy can correct me on the exact figure, but... I think 25% of science journalists reported that they were too busy to, to fact check. Is that right? Yeah, it was 24. 24, okay. Um, which is... <laughs> there you go. But at least I fact checked. Um, that's a disturbing statistic for a scientist, I think. And I, you know, which really harks back to our question, which is, do science journalists feel they are too busy? And, and I don't know if there's anyone in this room tonight who's in a position to answer that from a higher level, from an editorial level, but what, what can you do about this? I mean, does it really matter? Do you have to cover nine stories in a day? Would it not be better to cover two or three in depth? What, why is there such competition to cover more stories? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, part of the answer is, of course, hits and stats and advertising. Um, they all come from that. So, um, unfortunately, Google has contributed towards journalism too because now you go to Google News, almost all of their hits now because they drop down and suggest the story that you might go to, um, it's, it's even worse than it was. So unless you're out there first, unless you're a big news organisation, you, you don't get the hits. The majority of hits go over there. And as hits lead to advertising and everybody's chasing that, then you know you, you you know you have to get those stories out very quickly. Um, uh, I mean, on, on that, um, I I'd like to sort of return to Leveson a little bit, and um, I've been informed by my reliable sources that Leveson is already, in a sense, changing things at certain newspapers. Um, the fact that uh, Dacre had to defend a completely bunkum, you know, cancer story for 20 minutes. And, you know, very gamely he did it too. Um, that, that, I think, made people think um, about the way these things are done. And th th those are really the people that you need to get to, um, which is why I, I said earlier that I think um, it's really the readers and the consumers of this that have a, a great deal of power in terms of complaining to the right people at the right time. 
And do you, as nature, do you base it on, on clicks? Is that what really makes you well, decide? I, d I try Are not to... Are you more brand uh, Well, uh, you know, I've got, I've, got, I've, got a, I've got a chart beat open on my desk, looking at the hits coming in, surging, trying to, trying to do that. But no, I mean, but we're in a privileged situation. We have a very specific core readership. Um, many of whom are in this room. I hope not only the... Not all of them. Not all of them, I hope, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, so we're slightly privileged, but, you know... Did, Fiona, do you want to respond? I just wanted to come back to wait for the microphone. Chris's, Chris's thing about too many stories, because I think we should be a bit careful here, you know. Uh, one of the things none of us have said is that every single day, the national news media um, communicate the most amazing, important, controversial, critical science to a mass audience. You know, on one level, we should first bow at their feet before we rip them apart, because this is a very important service. And if it stopped tomorrow, we would be back where we were not that long ago, 15 or 20 years ago, where science was in the ghetto. And we know this because we've got uh, science media centres in Australia and Japan. They can't get science into the media. They can't get it onto the front pages. They have a completely different set of problems. So, of course, we want time for fact-checking, more original journalism. But the fact that people are writing six stories a day is a fantastic opportunity. It means their editors love science, there's an appetite. I love Tim Radford, but when he gives his speech about the golden age of science reporting, where he spent four days, you know, in Scotland looking for a story in a university, and finally, in the last hour, he picked on something. It was great. And then you say to him, so only, you only filed one story every five days. You know, there's an and are down here. So I think you, the key thing, which, which I think you and Petrock have done really well, is put this back into the science camp. If they, you know, read Flat Earth News, read Nick Davis, this is the way it's going, it's commercially driven, they have to write more stories. Can we help them to get those stories right? Fantastic, important, critical science stories, but get them right, accurate, the headline right, the story right, to a mass audience of people. If we can do that, seven stories a day in the Daily Mail is amazing. Oh, this hands out good. <laughs> and Andy, do you want to? The problem with the problem with that you know, laudable call is that sometimes the scientists' version of getting it right overlaps very, 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 very clearly with with their own interests, and that doesn't lead to you know a, a well-funded, well-resourced, critical science journalism as has been flagged up as a, as a really important thing so many times. It's just a small point, but. Sometimes the two can pull in opposite directions, if you see what I mean. Coming back to that question of what is the public interest? Whose idea? Is it the scientists reading of what the public interest is? Or the, yeah, there's all oh, those people. Uh, you've had your hand up for ages. Uh, the glass. Uh, hi, I'm Ollie Usher. I write press releases for the European Space Agency. Um, I've also got a story about Daily Mail reporter. Um, <laughs> she gets around. Which is that I, I, I have, on a couple of occasions, been Daily Mail reporter. And uh, that's not because I've ever got any money from associated newspapers, it's because my press releases end up in a Daily Mail pretty much <laughs> unedited under that byline. Um, and I, here's an anecdote which I'm throwing out here, not, not to make any broader point, but you know, just because I think it's curious. And that's that journalists, when they write stories, tend to be very, very careful about any suggestion that they might get them checked by the scientists and that they might get them um, approved. But every press release I put out has been read by the scientists involved in the study, has been approved by them, has been verified, and it's the angle which they want to put out there. Which means that the stuff that's going out as Daily Mail reporter, which is seen as being the worst kind of journalism, <laughs> is in many cases actually the stuff which is closest to what the scientist actually wants to be out there. Anyway, I think that's quite funny. I don't, is anyone aware of the site Futurity? It's an American-based website that uh, reprints content from university press... To, um, <laughs> departments, kind of provides press releases as media content in some way. I, if you haven't heard of it, I, I can recommend Googling Futurity and some of the arguments uh, that was sort of developed after it launched. There were, some, there were lots of other hands up a minute ago. They've all gone on down again. Uh, lady in the blue shirt in the middle. Yeah. Hello, I'm Sylvia McLean. I'm from the University of Oxford. And I think I'm one of the two p people that are scientists that's actually said something, it seems to be most... And, and you, sorry. Um, but it seems to be mostly journalists talking about it. So you say sort of vaguely science should, should interact with journalists, um, but I don't work on climate change, nor do I work on cancer, nor do I work on something, and I think this is true for a lot of us, that's going to necessarily be something that you're going to want on the first front page of The Guardian. In fact, most people might find it a bit boring and you have to, to sell papers. So what exactly do you, and people aren't phoning me up to ask my opinion on, even though I have them, on you know, climate change or whatever. <laughs> 
So in, in one way, what is it actually that journalists want from scientists? Because it seems to me that the people that are quoted in the paper are the same 16 people that are always quoted in the paper. Let's call this expert up from here and expert up from there. And I'd love to say I'm an expert, but I actually have to go to work tomorrow. And I also have to, you know, publish papers and people in my field will see that I said I'm an expert and yada, you know, and so on and so on and so on. So what is it exactly that journalists want from the body of scientists? You know, there's not just six of us. There's a huge body of, of people, and it's not very clear when people tell me to engage with journalism what that actually means. There, uh, there's uh, lots of more hands. Uh, another scientist? I happen to know that this is another scientist. I'm now feeling guilty that I haven't called upon scientists. Yeah, I, I, so I, I'd agree with... I'd kind of sympathise with that. I would, I would have said some of that. I also would like to point out that good science is not always correct. Right. So when, when you talk, for instance, about the MMR, it being the scientists' fault that some of these things were published, or these, these damn neutrinos, right? They're, they're, I have colleagues, there's a report in Spain. I work, I'm, by the way, I'm John Butterworth. I'm from University College London, physicist. I work at CERN and blog for ALOC occasionally. Um, the, our co colleagues are very nervous about putting things out. You've got to remember that the scientific journals are actually journals. They're, there's a debate goes on in them. The time scale is, is um, hugely longer than the, the cycle of news. But, but the first paper on a subject is rarely the final word, and it's often wrong. And these guys who put the story about the faster-than-light neutrinos out, for instance, have been cursed by other scientists. There was a, there was a, a um, news report on primetime Spanish TV, which was gleefully translated for me by a colleague, about how everything CERN has ever found was wrong because of a loose connector, right? Including the Higgs, the LHC, everything, no differentiation, the whole thing. Um, and it was like, you know, that's, you know, why are we talking to these people? So the, the, I don't agree with any of that, but I think you need to remember that, that, that if you say, for instance, with the MMR stuff, it was published, it doesn't mean it was right. But should you have sat on it? Should you have suppressed it? Should it have been suppressed by the scientists because they knew it would be misinterpreted? I think there has to be an awareness of the context within which this is done and that you know, peer review may be a kite mark but no kite mark's infallible and often those things are wrong. You know, scientists do have agendas and they do make honest mistakes and there are genuine uncertainties in a lot of scientific data. So I think that the prime duty of, of, a, of a science journalist is to be aware of that context and not necessarily fact check or and certainly not copy check but to, to just be, know enough about what they're reporting to know that, how, the method of, how the process of science works so that they can reflect that properly. Do the, do the journalists in the room feel able to do that? I don't know. Um, sorry, uh, guy at the, at the back of the jumper. Uh, hi, um, Will Heaven. Um, I'm an ex-computer scientist. I'm currently on the science communication course at Imperial. Um, I just wanted to ask the journalists in the room what they thought the, the role of a science journalist was moving into a future where um, everything moves online and the division between blogs and content written by journalists is, is blurred, and particularly on a site like The Guardian, which is expanding its um, blogging, science bloggers network, and those blogs are promoted on the front page alongside um, journalists' written stories. Yeah, is there new challenges with blurred things? Do people have a, a, com a response to that? Did, does John want to come back in terms of saying your blurred identity? Is, that, you know, is it different when you have someone who is writing on the front page of The Guardian website who's also a scientist? Um, all I can say is the main thing it's done for me is given, made me feel, I guess, I hate the word, but empowered a little. So if I go and say something stupid to John Humphreys in the morning, I can apologise for it in the evening in the blog. It's just coming. Thanks. I'm Adam Smith, a science journalist. I want to answer your question, really, in this issue of blurring and make some other points too. Um, I think that there is a distinction now, and I think there will remain a distinction between a blog which is you know, someone's opinion, and they might have spoken to other people, um, but it's not reporting, it's not journalism, and on the other hand, journalism. I think that there will remain that distinction, because I think if I write a blog post about something that I think, then I... As a writer, I do it in a different way. I approach it in a different way, and I think almost everyone knows that distinction. Whether we need a different badge for the different forms, I don't know. That's a different question. Um, but I think as well, just to um, stick with blogging and to go back to one of the points that was mentioned in the middle here um, about whether 
the proliferation of blogging is, is a good idea. Um, I actually, I think it is. I think it's great. I'm a non-scientist, and so I like to read all these blogs. I like to read all these really, really technical things um, that... If, if I'm looking at a story, I don't get all those technical things and I know that I'm not going to put them in my story because I don't get them. But I like to see discussion going on between scientists anyway. And so I do think that it's good that scientists are blogging. And I like that. And I think um, in my sort of former life, I was um, a reporter covering intellectual property law. Um, and there is very, very specific debates going on in the intellectual property law community. And as a journalist who wasn't an IP specialist, it was good for me to try and capture those debates. And so I think my final point is the difference between press releases and blogs. And I think that, um, Fiona, you were saying how uh, journalists won't... Could, uh, journalists don't go to blogs for stuff that they'll go to press release. And I know that there's an issue of time there, but I actually think that the culture is changing and I think, and, and I'd hope that people do recognise that blogs are a really important source for journalists because they get you into conversations that, that where you can't be physically. Um, do you want to respond directly to that? Because it was kind of going back to some of the things, the points that you made, and then I can see at least two bloggers or ex-bloggers that have got comments to make. So, um, <coughs> sorry, um, I actually have a response to that. As a scientist, and with my scientist hat on, I would say if you want to read technical stuff and you want to see a debate, you should read the scientific papers themselves. It's absolutely... I mean, I am astonished how often I talk to journalists, and they have never read a full science paper. They haven't even read the abstract and the conclusion. They just haven't read it. They don't see it as part of the material that they should read. And I don't really think that that's on. If you want to do a good job, you should not only talk to the scientists that did the report, but you should read their paper and you should read the back papers as well. If you want to see where it came from, you should do that too. I mean, this adds to time and everything. It, it, it sounds a bit like way. crawling through the Scottish Highlands. Doesn't it? But <laughs> it I, is. No, I completely agree with you. I, though I would also say, as someone who teaches a lot of scientists... Um, and science students. It would be good if some of them read some of the papers too. <laughs> Number of students, there's slight things they haven't read. But I would just say, <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you do, I mean, as a scientist, you make sure that you read the background. You make sure you, you know do, yeah. what you're yeah. doing and the context. Yeah. And as a journalist, if you want to read, the, if you want to have that, you shouldn't necessarily be reading the blogs. You should read the papers themselves. Can I just respond really quickly? Okay. Uh, we can talk in the bar after, but um, uh, I, I think the... Um, and you can have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> what was this? You were saying... No, I'm not going to... I reference Fiona from no, earlier. Go so, on, I... Um, <laughs> sorry, I just embarrassed you. Come on. Um, I'm not ever going to read all the papers. I'm not ever going to read all the background. I won't understand it. It's a complete waste of my time. Uh, and, and also, half the time they're behind a paywall. More than half the time which is a huge problem. That's a different debate, right? Um, but I think, I, I, to go back to your point earlier on th about what do journalists want from science, uh, or from science blogs, oh no, that was someone else up there. What do they want from science blogs? I think it's, it's stories, and I think that, um, yes, okay, there is all this technical detail that's in the paper, but actually that's not really what I want. I just like to look at it somehow, sometimes, and be bamboozled. But actually what I'm really looking for is, is a story. So I want to look at a blog and see the discussion because there's a story there. There's conflict. There's drama. There can be a digestion process to pick that up in blogs, I think. Um, you had a comment for a while. Is this continue? I hope this is on. Uh, my name is Frank Swain. I work at the Royal Statistical Society. And in response to Chris's point that... Uh, journalists should be forced or, or strong-armed into taking some kind of statistical uh, training. Uh, we, we run that. That's the project that I run. Um, I <laughs> so uh, I run a project that provides uh, statistical training to journalists and journalism students should they want it, and the demand is huge. Uh, do not think that journalists shy away from this. They know their weaknesses, they, they fully appreciate them, and they want to, to make amends for that. Uh, but... Uh, I wouldn't, you know, we've, we've spoken in, in lots of different schools and, and different newspapers we've gone to, and I won't mention names, but ones you like and ones you don't like. And um, I would be kidding if I said that some of this enthusiasm isn't down to the fact that the sessions we run are free. So we're funded, I'm funded by uh, the Department for Business Innovation and Skills and the Research Councils, but my funding will run out. And my question, uh, given that newspapers are in terminal decline... Uh, and, you know, Whitehall budgets are getting slashed too, is who is going to pay for this training? Maybe, go, yeah, maybe it goes back to... Frank in a job. <laughs> uh, you had a question for a while, do you know? 
Well, it wasn't a question, it was more of a comment. Uh, Sunny Hundel, I'm editor of a, a political blog called Liberal Conspiracy. Um, I guess the angle I'm coming from uh, to this is uh, from a political blog angle where we cover a whole bunch of Westminster stuff as well as science and, and climate change. And, and my thought was actually that to a large extent you should maybe separate out science from climate change. Um, as, as a, you know, because I kind of think that the debate around science is good and it's interesting, but climate change has become an entirely different and politicized issue. And, and a lot of the stuff that's being said here does not apply to that because it has become a, a, a political debate. And, and not entirely wrongly, because to a large extent, when you're moving past the science, you're kind of saying, we need to do something about this issue. Um, and whether that's uh, spending lots of money or investing in technology or whatever it is, mitigating climate, uh, climate change, you need to talk about political solutions. And that's where the actual debate has come to. And you've got now actual you know, attacks by the Daily Mail as well as the Telegraph on how investing in um, green energy is going to raise energy bills. So it's become a politicized issue. So the, so the question then is, uh, how do you deal with that? And my problem actually is that a lot of scientists try and debate and get into the political debate by saying, for example, they want to spend trillions on dealing with this issue, and that's when it backfires, because they don't really understand the political climate. They do a bad job of trying to get those messages across to people who are not already converted to the issue, and so they talk about social justice, or they talk about helping people in other countries, rather than talking about how people in this country would be affected by climate change and other issues such as uh, uh, you know, the cost to energy bills, etc. So I just think that there are actually two debates going on between, uh, within the climate change. I think, that's, I think it's interesting to wonder whether climate change is different from general science issues, or climate science is different from general science, other science, or health, again, is a different issue. Um, on the politicisation of climate, I think many other scientists might in the room, or, or, science, or anybody might say there are other areas of science that can be equally political, uh, and that politics and that issue of whether scientists should talk outside about their expertise is one that people will come up with different things. Do people have views on that or other similar things? Or, uh, People. We've got a few more minutes. If anyone's got a really burning thing, put their hand up really high. So I right, the woman in the, in the green jumper really literally needs to speak. Uh, hi, I'm a scientist. My name is Andrea Alenda. I work in UCL and just started blogging. Um, this was specifically for you. Um, it's just a comment. Uh, I've got no idea. Um, should a good um, journalist, science journalist, be able to read the science papers? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I, mean, I actually don't think we've got enough time on the clock to answer it, but, ah, but what we're going to do, all these questions are ones that we can pull out and keep talking. I'm going to try and write a piece for The Guardian with some more questions and then people can add in the comments. I don't think we're going to come to a conclusion today about how to fix science journalism. I don't want us to because then I'll be out of a job. Um, but also I think this is something we need to keep talking about in the pub and on comment threads in blogs, unless we really hate blogs. So, uh, there's another uh, person just, just left. Hi, um, Emma Davis. I fall into the none of the above camp, so <laughs> I'm a lay, lay person. Um, my question really is to turn around. We've heard a lot about the time pressures on journalists. My question really is um, around the time pressures on scientists. And what are we seeking from scientists? is an innate quality of a science the ability to publicise their work and to enhance public understanding, or is it in the idealised view to go and break down boundaries and discover new things and um, enhance our understanding of the universe? And there are some very good examples. You probably fall into the camp of the 16 scientists who always appear on blog posts and who always, who always appear quoted in journals. And there are particular examples like... I'm, I'm a lapsed, failed mathematician. So Marcus de Soltoy is a very good example of someone who has a particular role in publicising science and mathematics. But I would say that it's not an innate quality, my experience of mathematicians personally, um, of all scientists to be able to publicise their work and to be able to have a, an overview, rounded um, view of what the public need from science. I um, and I don't think it's necessarily something that 
we should seek to be part of a scientist's role? Well, well, there's questions about whether we see it as being the role of all scientists or one scientist within a research group. I think, yeah, this is a, yep, a large question. We've got. We ha are right up against the clock. I'm going to ask our two people who uh, started us off with their provocative points to conclude with one point each that they feel is their main take-home question, either for themselves, their own community, or the other one. Um, they're sitting and thinking. <laughs> what, what is your, your one take your main question that you're going to take home this evening to ponder on? Well, I think the issue of time is a very good one in terms of whether scientists have time. Everything that we've suggested involves scientists spending more time doing things outside science. And that, that's, a, that's a difficult one. We were actually talking about this on the train over here. How do you, how do you make this time? Um, that's certainly one thing we'll be thinking of. Um, otherwise, I guess my, my, my general point would, would just be that, you know, I hope we've convinced you that the three things we suggest are feasible and would actually help and I, you know, it'd be very interesting to talk to some of the journalists here afterwards to, to get some feedback as to whether if we did those three things, would it make your jobs easier? Would it make them harder? Would it improve the quality of news coverage? Would it have no effect? Um, that's what I'll be thinking about. Well, I can't possibly pick one, but OK. Um, well, seeing as it just came up and we haven't answered it, um, I was quite intrigued by the question, uh, should science journalists be able to read the paper? Uh, my initial gut reaction, as I'm sure almost every journalist in this room thought, was no. Um, but um, I think that can be finessed. Uh, it can be... Um, it can be finessed. Well... Uh, There's a lovely story that Tim Radford talked about, about the editor of Nature not being able to explain to him one of the papers in Nature. Well, right, right. And frankly... Um, uh, you know, I, I, I've got a PhD in molecular biology. My undergraduate degree was physics. I looked at a debate about helical, helical light and whether this would lead to greater bandwidth. Everybody covered it, but um, turns out that it may be a bit too good to be true. I could make head nor tail of the papers, I mean, with an undergraduate degree in physics or not. Ultimately, you always have to go back to your sources and get them to do the hard work. Um, so... Science is hard. Science journalism is hard. <laughs> uh, I think that's all I can really come from out of it, if I'm going to have to sum it up. We will be continuing this conversation on the Guardian blog, uh, and I hope that you'll continue the conversation in the bar. Um, and continue it in other places that you work, in the very, very various sites that you go, and continue to think about how you might share information with each other. Um, as Chris said, he's got those three points. He's really keen to know what you think about it. I think that's something that I can bring from today is that we can have conversations. I think that's why Alok set this up, is to provoke conversations and get people to help each other to learn more about each other, even if they don't necessarily agree or come to a conclusion. Uh, thank you to the Royal Institution for hosting us. Thank you for Alok for organising and thank you for our speakers. And thank all of you for, for your contributions. <laughs>